South Koreans' private data from North Korean cyber criminals who had hacked into local ATM companies. Using malware installed at some 60 ATMs in convenience stores and supermarkets, they allegedly cloned bank cards to withdraw around 90,000 U.S. dollars from Korea and abroad between last September and this March. The Cyber Bureau of South Korea's National Police Agency said it's a typical case of North Korean hacking and forgery and are investigating if and how the regime itself may have been involved. The Trump administration's point man on trade, Robert Lighthizer, is looking to cool speculation President Trump is close to terminating the South Korea-U.S. free trade agreement. Speaking in Mexico City on Tuesday, Lighthizer said Washington is looking to negotiate some changes to the five-year-old pact after concluding meetings on NAFTA with its Mexican and Canadian counterparts. The U.S. trade representative added the Trump administration would like to iron out differences and hopes for a successful discussion with South Korean representatives. President Trump has repeatedly slammed the deal as unfair to American workers, citing that since the FTA has been in force, the U.S. trade deficit in goods with South Korea has doubled from 13 billion U.S. dollars to over 27 billion in 2016. He even reportedly called for a possible termination last weekend. While it's true that the U.S. has a deficit in trading goods with Korea, it has enjoyed a significant surplus in services trade. Korea is one of the U.S.'s key economic and security partners, so termination of the deal is unlikely, especially given the rising tensions on the Korean peninsula. Trump is trying to gain negotiation leverage before a possible renegotiation of the FTA. American businesses and trade groups have also expressed concerns over the possibility of President Trump scrapping the deal. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce said it opposes withdrawal in the strongest possible terms, saying the move would not create a single American job but cost many. The Seoul-based Korea Institute for International Economic Policy released a study this week that estimated the U.S. has more to lose if it pulls out. It said that without the deal, South Korea's trade surplus with the U.S. would have been $260 million more than now due to higher tariffs. Wednesday summit talks between President Moon Jae-in and his Russian counterpart, President Vladimir Putin, became the meeting stage for the two countries' economic goals. After the summit talks, President Moon made it very clear that South Korea is the most appropriate partner for Russia's Far East development, as Russian President Putin's been hoping to develop his country's Far East region through cooperation with Asia-Pacific countries, while President Moon has been aiming to find new growth engines by expanding ties with Russia especially in logistics, railways and natural gas. Russia hopes to develop its Far East region through massive infrastructure investments such as airports, railways and electricity facilities. But such project has been facing difficulties because of sanctions from Western countries after Moscow's annexation of Crimea. South Korea should utilize this opportunity. Seoul and Moscow agreed to carry out joint projects at harbor areas of Vladivostok and work on signing an FTA between South Korea and the Eurasian Economic Union. They'll also kickstart on a bilateral level for now some projects they hope to carry out trilaterally with Pyongyang. The leaders made a more practical approach compared to previous talks. Regarding economic cooperation, the two sides used to be very abstract, but this time they were very specific, which signals higher feasibility. They are also very realistic, choosing to first focus on bilateral cooperation rather than a trilateral one with North Korea. But in regards to a growing threat posed by North Korea's provocations, the two leaders weren't able to narrow down their different perspectives. President Putin reiterated his stance that pressure and sanction can't be the ultimate solution to Pyongyang's nuclear ambition. And while Russia holds the key in cutting oil supply and cash flow to the North Korean regime, such measures weren't mentioned in the two leaders' joint statement. Russia's stance has not changed in terms of North Korea's nuclear development, but it seems President Moon stressed his view on the North Korean issue enough to have President Putin defend his position through his statement. However, experts say Seoul's expanded economic cooperation with Moscow could play a role in curbing North Korean threats. Putin wants the Russian Far East uh, developing. So he needs investment and economic cooperation with the Asia-Pacific countries. 
and North Korea is obstacle to his plan in developing uh, Far East. Moon Jae-in can maximize Korea's security interest by utilizing uh, economic issues. Although the two leaders didn't see eye to eye on all issues discussed at their summit, experts believe Seoul was able to gain leverage at some extent from Moscow for dealing with Pyongyang. As President Moon stressed, solving the North Korea issue and easing tensions on the Korean Peninsula are critical for the development of Russia's Far East. The market actually got the Cuban Missile Crisis right. When you look at, at the facts, uh, they were accurate. Uh, right. Now, certainly there was a 20% hit to, because of the Kennedy administration, uh, perhaps foreseeing what would happen. So the market was hit way before uh, Russia had put missiles there. But during that 13-day period, uh, there was uh, actually a, a pretty good indicator of what occurred, and certainly they were right. I think the market is actually going to be correct overall here. I don't see that you're going to ultimately see a problem. How do you deal with it as an investor? Okay, so look, there are things you can do. You can certainly go to cash. You can hedge through gold. You can hedge through uh, the Swiss franc. There are definitely things that you can do. But look, the best and safest is to go to cash. Yeah. Because even with gold, you just never know. And so uh, that would be the, the ultimate way to hedge. Yeah, and the market rallied, I believe, after the Cuban Missile Crisis was uh, resolved after that. And, and that's right. As you said, it went down a lot. And that's a good point in the months preceding as opposed to the week preceding, which I um, alluded to. So this time around, I mean, I don't know, but it's just it is a tough situation uh, for investors and do you think many people are focused on other things be it tax reform corporate earnings and kind of leaving this in the background or is North Korea front and center right now for what everybody does day to day I think North Korea is one of the factors I yeah. think you also have certainly the Trump uh, policy issues related to tax I think you also have the hurricane that's in the yeah. background as well the other issue is What's going to happen uh, now? President Trump tweeted about trade. I think that there's a concern that if you begin to mess with the underlying structure, the foundation of these interrelationships, so for instance, China, you begin to Bingo. sanction China mm -hmm. in a big way, uh, then that changes the dynamic. And right now, things are working. The economy overall on a global level is working. You, you begin to mess with it. You no, change it. You. That's interesting. And then all bets are off. Because if you look at it, the tra we brought it up a few minutes ago, the tweet he sent out, the president over the weekend, saying we're going to cut off all trade with anybody who does business with North Korea. And everybody basically said, well, he's not going to do that. He's not going to cut off all trade. China's our largest trading partner. But to your point, what if he does go a little bit harder, China? And the president's logic could be, listen, I'm going to take a little bit of an economic hit here because I think it's important to our national security. That could be an argument. It might not be all trade, but it could change that dynamic, right? And that's a market negative. I would have to think it is. Well, I think it changes the dynamic as it relates to China. And yeah. actually, I think it would be quite effective. I think when you begin to change uh, and and you know put forth some type of sanction on China I think you're actually going to get movement now on a global level investors are not going to like it because of right. what could be the case when you begin to change these elements the algorithm the fundamental components of the algorithm that's working I mean there's no question we have a global economy that's doing well you change it you put the market at risk mm -hmm. and it's going to react and I think part of what you're seeing this volatility is also coming from that yeah. uh, today. Yeah, we should keep that in mind because what was going on in North Korea, but it was compounded by economic issues, and I think that's really what caused this market to go down. Uh, there's a growing sense among investors that we're not going to get tax cuts or regulatory reform anytime soon because there's going to be there's disaster relief in, in Texas, uh, debt ceiling we have to deal with, and a few other things, keep, you know, passing a budget. Uh, those things are going to occupy Congress and the President, and you won't get the fiscal policy uh, stimulus that he wanted, which was getting rid of some, some lousy uh, regulations like Dodd-Frank and cutting taxes. And the reason why you know that is because some of the most pronounced declines in stocks today came from those stocks that would benefit from the corporate tax cut and getting rid of Dodd-Frank, namely Goldman Sachs right. and the financial. So that's what you have today. I think ha some of this was North Korea. A lot of it was the economic stuff that I just laid out. Um, you know, uh, Gary, the, the, clearly the, the, the president is looking at options with North Korea beyond just the traditional ones of squeezing off North Korea economically. Is it your sense right now 
that that is going to be a dominant theme and because the fear seems to be, however justified, it could delay some of this other stuff that the markets like to see, like tax cuts, like, like some of those reprieves that Charlie was outlining. Well, yes, I think uh, the fact that the U.N. was able to pass uh, sanctions on Chinese banks and also just sanctions in general against the North Koreans with Chinese support, that's significant. Um, so I would like to see stronger economic um, sanctions against North Korea. I think that's something that might settle the markets. I do have to, as usual, challenge, uh, you know, zoom out on that chart that you showed for today's trading and look at the past year since President Trump won. And it's always going up and up and up. It might go down a little bit, but the overall trajectory is going up. So I think there is a lot of positivity there. And, uh, you know, Charlie's right in terms of and yes, as a millennial, I said Charlie's right, uh, at least on this issue. Um, don't don't embolden him. Don't, don't embolden him. There. Uh, in terms of the uh, right. domestic Try to be polite here. <laughs> well, Robert, let me ask you about that, because uh, we know this meeting going on with this group of six is very instrumental in getting tax reform going. We do know as well the president's going to include in a separate meeting Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer on the belief that maybe he can get bipartisan support for these tax cuts whenever they happen. Obviously, the goal is this year. But what do you make of that? I'm very hopeful uh, because Nancy reached out back in March and, and tried to extend the olive branch, and now Republicans have extended the olive branch. Frankly, I'm kind of tired of them beating each other with olive branches. We need to see action. The Democrats have said that we're, they're ready to step forward and start the talks, uh, and the White House was receptive to that earlier last month. So but I really hope that we can come together. Said, Robin, are you, where she has said that, uh, and I believe Chuck Schumer the same, if any of it includes uh, relief for the very rich, they don't want any part of it. Are you in that camp? I do see their point, uh, but like I, I already reviewed his, his policy extensively. There are cuts for the middle class Americans. They'll get about $1,500 a year. I recognize that that's a much smaller percentage than the top 1% Listen, and corporations, but it talk, is there. Well, we, let's, don't let's we don't know, we don't know what the final package well, let's will talk, be. Let's talk real politics here, Neil. If, if, the Democrat, if, if, you th if President Trump thinks he's going to cut a deal with the Democrats and get it through a Republican Congress that raises taxes, it ain't happening. It's just not going to happen. And it's what would be, be the raising of taxes? You're buying the Gary Cohn line that you limit the increase of the upper income. You take away there's nothing, a lot of their write-offs. It would have a net effect of increasing the taxes. Here, here's where I think it gets problematic for, for President Trump. If the corporate tax cut is something marginal, like 25% instead of 20, that's really not too much of a cut, given that it's at 27% when you take out deductions right now. So say you take it down to 25 and get rid of all the deductions, guess what? That's not much of a cut. Or if, if you go on the, on the personal it's a 35 percent now. That's a statutory. But remember, level, that's that's but, a statutory level. But, but you, you say for it to be serious, it's got to be 20. Because you have least. because you would plug their their plan is to plug the the loopholes and you know and and basically if you plug the loopholes and only take it down to 25 percent, you're not getting yeah. much of a cut. And the other thing is on the personal side, let's just see this happening. Republicans like Paul Ryan, like Mitch McConnell, selling an in, a tax increase. To the American people, we should also point out that if your well, goal is to spur, I, I, I if your goal is to spur, if your goal is if your goal is to spur, if your goal is to let me just make this point, if your goal is to if your goal is to spur the economy. Uh, and you raise taxes on people who pay 50% of all taxes, well, namely the top 5%, you're there. not going to spur Carrie, the economy. What are you, what are you, final thoughts on that? Um, Speaker Ryan does not want to test yet. The Korean Central News Agency said the hydrogen bomb test ordered by leader Kim Jong-un was a success. The latest test took place in breach of UN sanctions and increased tensions between Pyongyang and Washington, D.C. China has strongly condemned. I, I tend to go with the latter. I think it's more of the same rhetoric and the, the game, uh, unfortunately, a, a game of rhetoric between the two, between the U.S. and, and North Korea, because you know, it's, it's, a, it's a political power struggle. And to me, sometimes it seems like they're just playing a game of who, who blinks first. And uh, the danger to that, of course, is that um, sometimes President Trump is unpredictable. We don't know what mood he's going to wake in, wake up in. And, you know, a lot of people are concerned that he may wake up one day and decide he's going to push the button and it's going to be very catastrophic for everyone involved. So obviously, people are reacting cautiously. China's calling for dialogue uh, because what else can you do? I mean, can you can you threaten to do military strikes? And what are the consequences of that? You know, for every action, there's a reaction. So I think people really do need to sit down and look at what the options are. 
we know that sanctions haven't really uh, done anything. They don't, they don't feel threatened by more sac sanctions. Right. Uh, the UN can do as many resolutions as they want, and that still doesn't change mm -hmm. anything. So I'm really not very optimistic about what really can be done um, other than to keep pushing uh, the, the, the Korean government. Brian Becker, take us into the mind of the North Koreans. You've been there many, many times at the DPRK as a journalist. Nikki Haley, who's the ambassador for the United States to the United Nations, came out with what I thought was an extraordinary, very clever statement yesterday. She said that Kim Jong-un was begging for war. Do you think he's begging for war? No, I think Nikki Haley may be running for president in 2020, so trying to get a little notoriety to use provocative statements like that. Uh, North Korea has endured a war. Between 1950 and 53, four million Koreans perished. That's almost one out of every five. Uh, there wasn't one structure taller than one story still standing in North Korea because U.S. bombers had leveled every part of the country. The main complaint of American pilots at that time was there's nothing left to bomb. So, no, North Korea is not begging for war because they know the horrors of war. What North Korea is doing against the most important, largest military power in the world that twice a year simulates the destruction of North Korea once again through war exercises is saying to them very predictably, they always say Kim Jong-un is unpredictable. He's not. He's been saying, we're going to uh, achieve a nuclear deterrent so that you can't attack us once again. And the only way to do that is to have a nuclear technology and a missile technology capable of reaching Americans so that all the bleeding won't be done on one side. So North Korea has looked at Iraq, they looked at Libya, the countries that gave up weapons of mass destruction, and those countries were invaded and their leaders were killed, and North Korea is saying, that's not going to happen to us. These are defense, defensive measures. So what should uh, America do? Not uh, provoke, not threaten them, not say the fire and fury is coming at you. What it should do is say, let's go back to the negotiating table, let's have bilateral talks, Let's end the Korean War once and for all. I mean, all wars have a beginning. All wars, except this war, have an end. This war should have an end. But the problem with that, though, is that for the U.S., ha allowing them to have a nuclear weapon or nuclear ambitions is non-negotiable. Well, I think the U.S., if you go back to the 1950s, they said Red China could never have nuclear weapons, that it would be something that would be unacceptable. But uh, guess what? America finally got to accept China as a nuclear power and, in fact, establish diplomatic and even friendly relations. So I think it can be done. And there's a, there are those who are, would argue that the, the playbook that the DPRK is following, too, is I that think they, it is. they want to go exactly in yeah. that regard. And Iran is watching as well how DPRK handles all of this. And where does it stop? <laughs> well, I think it could stop with the DPRK uh, agreeing to a freeze of its nuclear program. In other words, don't make it stronger, don't make it bigger, don't have greater uh, missile technology in exchange for the beginning of a normalization of relations. The, I think the DPRK is willing to do that. In fact, they offered it for the last three years. They said, we will suspend our missile programs and nuclear tests in exchange for a moratorium on war exercises. Obama said no twice, and then Trump said no in January. Why not say yes? Dan, no, say let's yes. <laughs> bring you in in Florida. Dan Perkins, author, commentator. Everything that we're being told in America by cable news and other outlets is the opposite, really, of what Brian and Maria have just articulated. Do you, do you think that the military option is further up the scale than Brian and Maria are suggesting? John, I have to thank you for thank you for having me on the show. Uh, I appreciate it. I I think that part of the challenge is that how can we trust that the North Koreans are going to say and do what they say they're going to do? The history is not positive. Oh, okay. When Mr. Clinton negotiated the, uh, the settlement where they got two nuclear reactors and five billion dollars, they told us after they did their first test of nuclear device four years later that they were basically working from the day they signed the agreement. So we can't trust them. Well, Brian, the young a, lady who was... Brian, let, the, me just, the young, let me let Brian answer that point. Well, it's they, a reasonable point that he makes, isn't it? No, it's actually not reasonable because, one, the 1994 General Framework Agreement, which he's alluding to, said that uh, DPRK will suspend its nuclear weapons program in exchange for heavy oil shipments and the creation of two white, light water nuclear reactors. In other words, 
reactors that can't create plutonium. The US never dug the first ditch, never opened up those plans. So seven, eight years later, after the United States didn't fulfill its part of the 1994 General Framework Agreement, DPRK, and this was after George W. Bush said a, a DPRK is part of the axis of evil with Iran and Iraq. Then the DPRK said, guess what? We're canceling our commitment to the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and we're going to start building nuclear weapons. Okay, Jessica Stone, White uh, House correspondent. You, you, oh, go on, Dan. Yes, go ahead. You, you deserve yeah, a, but, a chance but, to but respond. President Clinton admitted after they signed the agreement that one of the most difficult parts of the, that had yet to be settled was the verification that they were doing what they do. They refused to do it. My point is that we've, we've had a, lots of discussion diplomatic discussions, and I don't think that that's going to work. Okay. I wrote a piece today on uh, Newsmax of where I've talked about what we need to do is move away from all this sanction and do a total embargo of North Korea. Well, let's We've bring got in five ports. Jessica Stone. That's very Jessica. close to what uh, the president articulated in his tweet over the weekend, isn't Jessica, it? Jessica, you are our White House correspondent. <clears throat> You're in and out of the West Wing all the time. You know what they're thinking in there. And I believe that you think that they, that they want to try and resolve this using trade as a weapon. Is that right? Well, that's certainly what I've had a senior administration official articulate, that they're looking to use trade with China in particular and the U.S.-China trade relationship to squeeze China, to squeeze the DPRK. I don't think that that's something we haven't sort of picked up on with some of the increasing yeah. um, tensions in the trade relationship. But, 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 when I, but when I look at the West Wing, I wonder really if they have a plan for this. It seems to me very confusing. Donald Trump puts out a tweet. General Mattis, the defense secretary, will say something tough. But, but do you think there's an actual plan that they work I see Treasury towards. and Commerce lining up things that they can level, levy against the Chinese in particular. If you see the Chinese and the Chinese alone as the only tools, which a lot of people don't. Um, but I think this administration um, is looking uh, to work with China closely on that, and they think they'll be able to do that better if China has um, some incentive with the trade relationship. The problem is that at the same time, I have Chinese officials telling mm -hmm. me, um, you know, hey, this is sort of something we're getting used to from this president. This is the way he talks, and it's not like the U.S. is ever going to stop doing business with all of the countries that trade with Chi with uh, with the DPRK, especially with China. I mean, it's a, a huge training partner for the United States. It mm -hmm. would undermine the entire global economy. But and the, also, I, I was going to second that in the in the sense that I don't think China is going to go along and, and just sit there and, and take it. Um, I think it's going to be counterproductive for the U.S. as well. I don't think China is going to sit there and allow uh, this sort of a you know a trade war of sorts. Um, I think it's it's a it's a loose loose proposition. Dan is dying to get back in in Florida. <laughs> Dan, let's yeah. bring you back in. Ninety-three percent of the exports of North Korea go to China. The total aggregate value of exports in a 12 month period is equal to 38 hours of export from China to the United States. Well, yes, but what China, I think, wants is stability over anything else. And it may have made a decision that it's done what it can regarding Kim Jong un and Pyongyang. And now the cards have to fall as they may, Brian. Yeah, indeed. And North Korea doesn't follow the dictates of Beijing or Moscow. It didn't even during the socialist camp. I mean, uh, the, the DPRK does not have foreign soldiers on its soil, as South Korea does. So it's a fully sovereign country. Vladimir Putin said today they'd rather eat grass rather than give up their nuclear weapon system because they consider it to be an existential part of their very survival given the fact that the United States is dedicated to carrying out regime change. That means, and we can see from the pattern, that no amount of economic sanctions will deter DPRK from doing what it's doing. The only thing that can change the game is for the US to say, look, they're a nuclear power, but we don't want a war, so let's start talking. Let's have bilateral negotiations. So, Dan, it looks like the Trump administration is going to have to accept a nuclear North Korea. That seems as if that's the way this is going. Well, I, th I think if, if the embargo, which stops everything going in and out of the country, uh, if the people have to start eating grass, as the, your other guests said, at some point in time, they're going to get tired of eating grass. And they, they themselves may stand up and say, enough is enough. I mean, okay, they're so already 
poor and, and, and hungry, uh, I, I think that yeah. the most practical approach is an economic embargo. Forget about all the other sanctions. Just stop everything mm -hmm. from going in or out of the country, and that may bring them to the table. When you deprive 28 million people of food and medicine, when you use food and medicine as a weapon, it, one, it's a violation of international law. It's a crime against humanity. And secondly, it's an act of war. And so the DPRK will see that as an act of war. And then and when you said what well, their people, you know, it's going to be sort of like giving them an excuse. And, 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 you know, he could always go back to his people and say, see, this is exactly what they're doing to us. Mm. So it's going to be us versus them. They're already doing that by denying those things but to their people but and feeding the, feeding the military. No. The, the China, uh, the U.S. imports $463 billion worth of products from China. China will not accept this. The United States cannot cut off economic relations with uh, China, no matter what Donald Trump tweets about or what, whatever Nuchin or what other cabinet officials have some fantasy that they can somehow bully China. Uh, in fact, that would be a catastrophe for the U.S. economy, and all politicians actually know that. Okay.